Happy Sabbath, Kendall SDA, Homestead SDA, and everyone else that is joining us today. We are very happy to see you here, and we're very blessed to be able to connect with you through social media. Before we start today's message, I have three things that I want to remind you. First, online giving. KendallSDA.Church and HomesteadFL.AdventistChurch.org are the two websites where you can go and give your offerings and your tithes. Secondly, remember to share the sermon with a friend. Right now is a good time to text a friend or share the link to someone so they can come and watch the service with us. Thirdly, below you're going to find some links that you can click and you can find some worship songs that go along with today's message and also a children's story for little ones that goes along with the message. We're very happy to have you here. Hope you enjoy your sermon. See you soon.
me sing that. I will always worship. worship you. As long as, as long as, as, long as I'm breathing. I together and I Mercy, David and Saul. 
This is David. Hey. David was a shepherd who lived in Israel. David was chosen by God to be the next king of Israel when he was just a boy. But David had to wait a very long time until that promise would come true because there was another king of Israel named Saul. Saul was strong and tall and looked like everything a king should be. But Saul did not follow God like he was supposed to. And for that reason, God chose to take the kingdom from Saul's family and give it to David's. David became a great warrior. Arr! And everyone in the kingdom loved David. Huh? This made Saul jealous, and Saul hated David because he thought he would try to kill him and take the throne from his family. So Saul wanted to kill David. Whoa! Saul hunted David, but he couldn't catch him. One day, Saul heard that David was in the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul gathered 3,000 of his skilled fighters and went to find and kill David. During Saul's search for David, he went in a cave to relieve himself. Well, this very cave was the one where David and his men were hiding. And when David's men saw that Saul was unaware that David was there and unable to defend himself, they said, Now's your chance, David. This is God telling you that he will give you your enemy to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. But then David began to think that it was not right for him to take Saul's life. For no matter how much hardship and difficulty Saul had caused him, it was still not right for him to hurt the one who God had placed over Israel. So David told his men to back off, and he did not let them kill King Saul. They waited until after Saul had left the cave. And then David ran out of the cave and shouted after Saul, My king! Why do you listen to people who say I am trying to harm you? Look, I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I am not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you've been hunting me. David went on to promise that he would never harm Saul. David said that God would be the one to protect David and to rescue him from Saul's power. Saul said, Is that really you, David? And he began to cry. Saul said, you are a better man than I. You have been amazingly kind to me today, for when God put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would have done this? And now I realize that you are surely going to be king, and the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. But promise me that when that happens, you will not kill my family. So David promised that he would not hurt Saul's family, and they left each other in peace. Now Saul continued to cause difficulty in David's life. But David kept his promise and in time, David did become king of Israel. David was dearly loved by God and Israel did flourish under his rule because David did everything that God wanted him to do. And he was a man after God's own heart. Why don't you emphatically turn to your neighbor and tell them my sermon title, we gonna have church in the wild. Why don't you turn to the person you just ignored and tell them we're gonna have church in the wild. In the wild. Let us pray. God, as we open your word, May our hearts be open to you. In your name I pray. Let God's people say, Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Before there was 444, before there was the Lemonade album, before there was the Kanye and Jay-Z beef, 
they recorded an album, and on that album is a hit song entitled, No Church in the Wild. Now, I don't know what spurned the title of this song. I'm not so sure they were in church when they came up with the title. But as I was looking at this passage of scripture and I was preparing to preach, I recognized that David wanted to have church in the wild. And as I was thinking and looking at the text, a question came to me. Have you ever had to worship God in a strange place? And I'm talking about, have you ever had to worship God when your life is crumbling all around you? Have you ever had to worship God when you don't feel like worshiping God? Have you ever had to worship God when the bottom of your life is falling out from underneath you? Have you ever had to worship God in a strange place? Have you ever had to worship God when life doesn't make sense anymore? And in Psalm 63, David finds himself in a strange place. David finds himself in the middle of a dry and arid wilderness place. David finds himself at a time in his life when his life doesn't make sense. And David now is forced to worship God in a place he's not used to worshiping God in. The reason why he's in the wilderness is because his own son Absalom is hunting him down to try and kill him. His whole family is in disarray. His life doesn't make sense. Not only that, but his son Absalom is trying to take the kingdom from underneath him. And the reason why David finds himself in this spot is because he took too long looking at the beautiful bathing bombshell called Bathsheba. Looked at her a little too long. He saw her. He called her over. And before you know it, uh, she was pregnant with a child. And after that, God, God says, you're not going to have the child. The child dies. And God says, the sword shall never leave your family. I've come to find out one thing about God. And the one thing I found out about God is this. He will forgive your sins, but you can't forgive consequences. And so what's happening now, not only is he in a dry place in his life, not only is he in a wild and arid place, but the desert actually reflects the situation that he's going through in his life presently. Not only is he having to deal with all of this, but he has to deal with the guilt of his sin while he is running for his life in a place that he can't find food or water. If you look at a couple things here, you look at David is worshiping God. Look at his location in the middle of the wilderness. He is no longer in the palace. He's not around his servants anymore. He's not around the comfort anymore. He's not around, he's not sitting out on his throne. He is in a place where he has every excuse not to have church in the wild. Look at his circumstances. His family is in disarray. Life doesn't make sense. And when you look at his circumstances, he has all the excuses in the world not to have church in the wild. If you get nothing else from this sermon today, Miracle City, I want you to get this. I want you to get this. Your view of God determines your praise. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go a little further. I will say that your view of God determines everything about you. And we must understand that David's view of God is healthy. Because David isn't viewing God as to what God can do for him. He is worshiping God simply because he is God. Okay, some of y'all still don't get it yet. So let me say it this way. David is not in a friends with benefits relationship with God. He is not 
in a relationship or trying to worship God based on what God can give him. He is worshiping God simply because God is God and God alone. That's how he viewed God. And so some of you may be saying to yourself, Pastor, I don't understand. You have, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard the things that I'm going through right now. I'm going through some stuff that I can't explain. Matter of fact, it wasn't even my fault. I don't understand what's going on. Well, I have a couple things to share with you. How you make it through the wild and dry, arid places in your life. First thing you got to do is you've got to desire God. You've got to desire God. It says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. Oh God, you are my God. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. Notice, if you will, that David is asking God for spiritual food. He is thirsty. He is hungry. He's in a place in his life right now. We are, and he's in a place where he's, he's hungry, he's thirsty. And instead of asking God to give him water and food, he is asking God to give him spiritual food. You must understand that when you're going through stuff, some of us want to ask God to, to, to give us what we think we need. But in actuality, we should be asking God to develop our character. So we, we, we're asking God, God, can you, can, can, can you deal with my finances? And God is saying, I need you to understand stewardship. You're looking for a job and you're saying, God, find me the job. When you should be praying, God, help me to get patience. You see, because if you get it right in the spiritual, then the physical would make sense. And David understands this. David understands that it's a spiritual battle, not a physical battle. So I'm not going to ask God for food or water. I'm going to ask God for his presence. Because when I'm in his presence, I can worship him. Notice the next thing about the text. It says, oh God, you are my God. In the Hebrew, the word for God is El, and there's a personal pronoun that's attached to the word for God. So what David is saying here is, I want a personal God in my wilderness experience. I want God to be present with me. Have you ever been in a time in your life when you feel God distant and you're saying, God, I know you are God, but I need to feel you right beside me. God, I understand that you sit high and you look low, but God, I don't need you sitting high. I need you sitting right beside me. God, I understand that you are God, but right now, God, I need a friend in the middle of my storm. God, I need you personally in my life. Because sometimes life doesn't make sense. And sometimes we need a God that's a personal one. Sometimes we have to have a personal experience with God. When we go through the storm, we've got to desire that personal connection with God. You know, recently, I, had, I, got a, I got the Amazon tap as a gift. I got the Amazon tap and when I first opened it for about a week, Alexa and I... We're in full conversation. Matter of fact, I found out some very cool things about Alexa. I can play Jeopardy with Alexa. I say, Alexa, let's play Jeopardy. And Alexa gives me the, uh, the questions from that day's uh, uh, episode on Jeopardy. Also, if I wanted to order more food in the house, I can say, Alexa, can you order more cereal? And two days later, through Prime, she orders it and it's there at the door. Listen, man, Alexa is the best thing since sliced bread. I also found another thing about Alexa. I say, Alexa, give me my morning briefing. And I programmed Alexa to the point where Alexa can read to me my morning devotional. From the comfort of my bed. Come on, somebody. 
Not only that, after that, Alexa then reads to me my Sabbath school lesson from the comfort of just by saying, good morning, Alexa, my, give me my morning briefing. I say, pause, Alexa. Alexa pauses, and I pray to end my devotion. I say, Alexa, continue, and she gives me the news briefings and the top headlines for that day. Afterwards, she reads me a quote, and I'm ready to attack my day. I am having all this fun with Alexa, and my wife is saying, honey, why are you talking to Alexa so much? I said, honey, I mean, Alexa is really cool, you know? And she said, one day, Alexa is not going to be able to help you. So one day I'm in the shower. I forgot the soap. I said, honey, can you get me the soap? She said, why don't you ask Alexa? Oh. Listen, y'all. In that moment... I was reminded that my personal relationship with my wife is going to be able to get me through some things that an artificial personal relationship can't get me through. Oh, so let me come a little closer to you. Before the storm, y'all are bosom buddies, y'all are talking, y'all are texting. In the middle of the storm, y'all not talking. Some of us want to rely on artificial relationships to get us through our storm when Jesus Christ is the only relationship we need. We must understand that Jesus sticks closer than a brother. He ain't never going to leave you. You must understand that Jesus will always be with you in the middle of the storm. No matter how hard it gets, Jesus said, I am your ultimate ride or die. So we've got to desire God. While we're going through our wilderness experience, we've got to be able, while we're going through our wild and dry places, say, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth because my worship is not predicated on my situation. My worship is not predicated on my location. It is predicated on the divine being that God is as long as I desire him. I will get through the storm. Second thing you got to do, you got to praise God in the wilderness. You got to praise God in the wilderness. Look at verses 3 through 5. It says, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. With the predicament that David finds himself in, someone would think it would be difficult to worship God. Because during the time of David, if you wanted to be in the presence of God, you had to make your way to the sanctuary. If you wanted to get forgiveness of your sins, you had to bring a sacrifice to the sanctuary. If you, wanted to, if you wanted someone to intercede on your behalf, you had to go to the high priest. But David is in the wilderness and there is no sanctuary in sight. There is no high priest present. There's nobody there that would indicate to him or nothing, nothing there that would indicate to him that he is ready to have church. But if you will look at verse number, and verse number three says, my lips will praise you. It says, I will lift up my hands in your name. There in the wilderness, he had no sacrificial uh, item to bring to the sanctuary. There was no high priest. But David says, in the wilderness, I am going to worship you. David is saying, I don't need a praise team. I don't need an organ. I don't need a preacher. I don't need a church building. All I'm going to do is lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Because my help cometh from God. He says, I don't need a whole lot to worship God. All I need is myself and I will give it to God. I've come to realize one thing. 
Some of us, I refuse to go and get the new iPhone. The thousand dollar one I'm talking about. You know, past, 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 Pastor David got, already got his iPhone. I already said to him last night, I'm, I'm trying not to get it. But let's be honest. We go and get Apple products now simply because of what comes with Apple. So one day, one night I woke up, one morning I woke up rather, and uh, my phone was, was out. I don't know what happened, couldn't turn it on. I got it from beep, shall remain nameless. I went back to the store because that's where I bought the phone, not an Apple store, just my carrier. And went there and said, listen, my phone is blank. Um, how can you help me? They says, well, sir, I'm sorry, we can't help you. You got to take it to Apple. But I was like, I got the phone here. Then they said to me, uh, uh, sir, uh, why don't we put you in a digital line and you'll wait? I said, maybe somebody else will help you. I waited in the digital line for about 10 minutes. After that, someone came to me and I said, uh, my phone is blank. Can you help me? They says, I'm sorry, we can't help you. Then I said to them, why did I stand in line in the first place? So I'm upset at this point. I'm thinking, beep, could help me, but they can't. So I'm saying, all right, where is the closest Apple store? Well, from where I live to my carrier store is only five minutes. The Apple store is 30 minutes from where I live. Now, if you know anything about Miami, the traffic is horrid at around 9 a.m. So I got in the car and I'm driving. It took me about almost 40 minutes to get to the Apple store because of all the traffic. Got there at 9.50, showed up. There was a long line in front of the store and I said, oh my goodness. I'm going to have to wait even longer. But I saw one thing that was different. I saw Apple attendants out front getting people's problems before the store opened. I said, hmm, there's something a little different about this. I went, I said, listen, I need to get my phone fixed. I went inside. When I went, when we, I, I'm frustrated and everything. When we, when they opened the door and I walked in, they started cheering and clapping. I'm like, what is this? I've never experienced anything like this. And I sat down and I said, tell, that's all, listen, my, my phone is back. I said, no problem, sir. We're going to get it fixed. They took my phone. And while I was sitting there, I'm noticing uh, that they had people sitting around screens learning about the different features of Apple. Older individuals I'm talking about now. And they're trying to learn all this. I said, oh, they have small groups <laughs> in the Apple store. I said, oh. The certain, the person. The, uh, the person came back to me and said, sir, um, just give us a couple minutes. Your phone will be fixed. I said, okay, cool. No problem. Um, he said, it's going to take us about 20 minutes. He came back again and said, your phone is fixed. I was inside the store for all of 10 minutes. They undersold and over delivered. I went in frustrated and I left with a smile on my face. I went in upset and I left happy. I went in with a frown on my face and I left with a smile on my face. Church, I'm trying to tell you, we need churches more like Apple stores. Because you must understand, it's not about the building, it's not about the praise team, it's not about what the preacher says, it's about what you know about God that can bring you through. So David realized that his worship is not predicated on his situation. The third thing you need to understand when you're going through your wilderness experience is this. Remember God in the wilderness. The Old Testament is replete with instances of God trying to remind the children of Israel to always remember who he is. We see that in the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We see this with Ebenezer, the rock of deliverance. We see this also again when the children of Israel went uh, and they crossed the Jordan River. And after they, they crossed the Jordan River, they had to erect a monument of remembrance to remember what God has done. 
So when you're going through your stuff, you've got to remember what God has done in order for you to understand what God can do now and what he will do in the future. But I want you to see something in the text. It says, David says, when I remember you, I meditate on you in the night watches. There were, there were three different watches during the Jewish time. There was sunset to 10 p.m. That was the first watch. Then there was 10 p.m. To, to 2 a.m. That was the second watch. The third watch was 2 a.m. to sunrise. So David is saying, I, no, no matter the time of night that I find myself in, I will always meditate on God. You must also understand that this is kind of like Hebrew poetry. David is also using night to, 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 to get as an analogy for his present situation. So from sunset to 10 p.m., it's usually you're getting into the night. There's a little bit of light. David says, I remember you, God. When it gets to the darkest moment of the night... When things uh, come out, uh, when uh, you, you, you're mostly at danger, David says, God, I will remember you at the darkest moment. And David says, when it looks like I'm about to get out of my night and I see the sunrise, I still will remember you. Okay. Look what David says now. Next thing David says, he says, for you have been my help. Okay, this is not going to hit you until I explain it. This, until I explain the tense, it's past perfect progressive tense. It's a past perfect progressive tense. Okay, for those of us who are not English scholars, let me break this down a little bit. It says, this tense is used to show that an ongoing, let me say it, an ongoing action in the past has ended but when i read that i said mm, i'm looking at that from a hu from human eyes let me look at this from god's eyes god is not limited by time or space in our human mind what happens in the past has ended but in god's mind what is happening in the past is also happening in the present and is also happening in the future all at the same time So you're, look, you, you're praying to God that God would work out what you're in right now. But you need to understand that God, if God worked it out in the past, he's also working it out now. And he's also working out the one that's coming in the future all in the same time. He is not limited by time. He's not limited. You must understand that we serve a great God. He's in the past, present, and future all at the same time. So David remembers God in the middle of his wilderness experience. David remembered that when he went in front of Goliath that God slayed the giant. David remembers that God spared his life when Saul tried to take it. David remembers that God forgave him when he messed around with Bathsheba. He remembered God now in the darkest period of his life. And God is trying to tell somebody here today, if you're going through something, to remember God in the middle of the storm. Because if he did it yesterday, he's going to do it today and he's doing it tomorrow all at the same time. I know I'm in Maryland. I know I got people here with some government jobs and Mercedes in the parking lot with red bottoms on. But I just want to know, does somebody in here want to give God praise in the middle of their storm? Must you come to God, acknowledge God, remember him. If he did it before, he will do it again. Do I have any company in the building? So you might think this sermon is about worship, but this sermon really is about theism, our view of God. Because once you get your view of God correctly, you'll worship God correctly. Okay, by the look on your faces, y'all don't get it. So let me break this down. As y'all know, I'm from Florida. Florida is the capital 
for family vacations. Well, Orlando. I'm not so sure about Miami. Um, we're just going to keep it in Orlando. <laughs> so I heard the story once of this family that went to Universal Studios. They went to Universal Studios and it started raining while they were in the theme park. The worst thing that can happen in Florida when you're at a theme park is when it starts to rain. So they went inside uh, to, to get cover from the rain and uh, they had a family huddle. It was a family of five and the wife said she's going to take the daughters. The son says she, um, the, the, the husband says she's, he's going to take uh, the son. And so in order to get them uh, uh, not being restless anymore, they decided that we're going to play, the father and the son, we're going to play rock, paper, scissors. For the life of me, I don't understand why they decided to play rock, paper, scissors. Because rock, paper, scissors gets old real fast. So about five rounds of rock, paper, scissors, uh, the father noticed that the son uh, was getting restless. He was getting bored. So the father says, let's play a different version of rock, paper, scissors. Let's play rock, paper, scissors, superhero. So the boy light up. He says, all right, we are universal. So the father says, rock, paper, scissors. And the aim of the game is that when I call, when I call out a superhero, we argue on which superhero is the best. So the father says, rock, uh, the son says, rock, paper, scissors, Batman. The father says, rock, paper, scissors, Superman. The father says, Batman has no powers. No, the son said, no, but what, and the father asked him, what superpower does Batman have? The son said, he's rich. <laughs> but the father says, he actually has no superpowers, so Superman wins. The son is actually really upset. Best out of three. Second one, the father says, rock, paper, scissors, Thor. And the son says, rock, paper, scissors, Wolverine. That's no contest. Thor won that one. So the father is now gloating in the fact that he won the best out of three. And the son said, Dad, let's play one more. If I win this one, I win everything. Winner takes all. So the father started laughing. He says, son, you're not going to beat me. So the father says, rock, paper, scissors, Superman. And the son says, rock, paper, scissors, Jesus. This is obviously not an atheist family. And so, the fa and, so, and so the father laughed and he said, and this is what tied all experience together. The father says, son, why did you choose Jesus? And the son said, because Jesus is bigger than anything. Church, I'm going to tell you today that this boy's view of God is a healthy view. Because a couple years from that when he's in high school and he's faced with peer pressure, he can stand on his own two feet and stand up to peer pressure and say, Jesus is bigger than anything. When he's in college and he has a, a professor that's trying to push evolution, he can say, I believe in creation because Jesus is bigger than anything. And when his marriage is on the rocks and he's praying before God he can say God is bigger than my marriage and when he has to lay his wife to rest through the tears he will say Jesus is bigger than anything do I have anybody in here who just wants to bless the name of God in this place because Jesus is bigger than anything you must understand that David worshiped God because he understood that Jesus is bigger than his circumstances. You must understand that when you worship God in the wild, you're worshiping God in a space in your life that is not easy to give God praise. There's somebody in the house today who's looking for a way out of a situation. And I've come by here to let somebody know 
that Jesus is bigger than your problem. Stop looking at your problem and start looking at Jesus. Because the fact of the matter is, sometimes we pay so much attention to our problems that we erect monuments of remembrance to our problems and we start taking on a defeatist mindset. When if we pay attention to Jesus, we know that Jesus will bring us through. Jesus is bigger than your problems. I'm going to close it right now. You may be saying, Pastor Smith, that sounds good and all. I want to tell you from personal experience that I've been there. I had to realize for myself that Jesus is bigger than anything. I had to have worship in a really dry place in my life. When I was eight years old, I saw my father die in front of me, drowned at a beach. When he died, I lost my mind. I lost my belief. For many years, I carried this resentment against God. God, if you are truly God, why didn't you save my father? If you're God all by yourself, you could have just come down from heaven, touched him, and healed him. Why didn't you save him? When I was in high school, the resentment got so bad. I said, God, I don't believe in you anymore. And while I was kneeling beside my bed, I was crying my eyes out. I said, God, why did you allow this to happen in my life? And he said, son, I'm the best father you can have. I'll never be late. I'll always be on time. I'll never miss any of the big moments in your life. I will always be there. He says, son, you may have lost your earthly father, but you've gained a heavenly one. Son, if you want to make it through your sorrow, you've got to bend down and you've got to remember me in the midst of what you're going through. Son, I am here with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm talking to somebody in here today. Does somebody understand that Jesus is never going to leave you nor forsake you? You must understand that when you worship God in the midst of your storm, He'll always come through right in time. From that day I believed. I had to rely not on an earthly father, but on a heavenly one. And I came to the point that in any dark moment in my life, I will always have a praise on my lips. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise be thankful I said be thankful I said be thankful I said be thankful I said be thankful unto him and bless his name I said bless his name I wish I had somebody in the house today that be willing to bless the name of the Lord right now I know what you're going through it may not make sense but you gotta bless the Lord you're, you're going through some tough times but you gotta bless the Lord you've got to worship God in the middle of the storm worship him because he's bigger than anything Turn the volume up on your phone, on your computer, on your television. Worship the Lord with us. We invite the presence of God into the space right where you are. Come on, put those hands together. Here we go. What have you turned into wine? Open the eyes of the blind. 
There's no one like Say into the darkness Into the darkness and shine Yeah Out of the ashes we rise There's no one Awesome in power.